Capital One is our sponsor here at OSCOM for a day of discussions about open source and why it is so important for new stack organizations everywhere. Capital One is at the forefront of this new open source world with several efforts such as the opening of its APIs and open sourcing core technology such as Hygieia, its DevOps dashboard. Learn more about Capital One and its focus on developers at developer.capitalone.com. Hey, it's Alex Williams here at OSCON for another day of coverage uh, about the open source ecosystem. And today we're really going to be looking at the open source ecosystem and, you know, and the technologies that are so important to it. And so I'm very excited to start the day with a discussion about unikernels. And I'm joined by three people who uh, are quite knowledgeable about unikernels and their role in open source. Uh, Anil Madhavapetti of Docker. Hey, Anil. Ian Iberg of Defer Panic. Hey, Ian. Hey. And Joshua Bernstein of EMC Code. Good morning. Good morning. So, you know, we were just chatting a little bit before about the, the role of open source and unikernels and where unikernels really are right now. And I have a few questions. I want to, you know, I'm curious about the pure unikernel play, the, the unikernel container play, and really just the, you know, how unikernels really are going to scale and the role of open source in that. So, Ian, tell us a little about what you were know, saying because you were mentioning how you had actually written, written a story for the new stack on on unikernels and you're looking at it from a five-year perspective but now you see it as a bit different yeah i mean uh thanks to guys like this uh anil i mean he's he has several papers on the subject <laughs> which i was reading last year and uh you know i i last year i would have said you know unikernel adoption is five years out um but you know as we start kind of toying around in the ecosystem um, you know, we're using them in production today, and there's other people that are using them in production today. And so it's really only a matter of time. And as I mentioned earlier, this is, this is definitely going to be a breakout year um, this year. So, uh, Josh, you guys introduced, uh, uh, you open sourced Unikernel technology just a, you know, a few weeks ago. Can you tell us about that and what it is and uh, what your guys' thoughts are, uh, you know, about why you decided to, uh, you know, uh, you know, launch this unikernel technology and make it open source? Yeah, of course. So I think that um, what we see or, you know, what I've seen with my experience with containers and, and virtual machines is that people want sort of the, the security ideas around a virtual machine and they want the convenience and they want this lightweight design of, of a container. And so I think the unikernel concept um, makes a lot of sense for those, those types of people um, to get the best of both worlds. Um, we um, kind of early, early announced a, a project called Unique, which is basically a set of tools um, to build your application and wrap it inside of a, a unikernel container, effectively. Um, we can argue about the lingo later if you guys... I, I love uh, the name. Yeah, so... Um, and. Um, and, and it's, it's just basically a, a tool chain, a pipeline to take an application, compile and build the application, put it in a disk image and wrap a kernel around it, and then deploy it through a tool set and a tool chain that people kind of already expect. So Unique supports Docker Run and Docker PS and kind of these standard Docker interfaces that people have enjoyed using, but now we've, take, we've sort of uh, wrapped that inside of a kernel instead of just a container. So, uh, you know, so you're mentioning the security uh, a angle. Yep. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that people, uh, we, we saw the same sort of hesitation when virtual machines came onto the market. Well, can I run multi-tenant environments inside of a virtual machine, right, with two virtual machines on the same host? Is it secure enough? We had this sort of same argument about containers and things like that years, in, or virtual machines years and years ago. And um, I think that what we're doing is, is sort of speeding the adoption um, from these full heavyweight virtual machines into more lighter weight containers. And, and um, people are, we, we've basically just extended the security into the, into the container. And if you can do it and if you can build it and if you can interact with those now virtual machines effectively using tool sets that the entire open source community has already embraced, then I think there's a lot of benefit there and that's sort of the value that we were after. So. I was I was saying I was listening to actually a podcast last night, Arrested DevOps. You guys listen yep. to that? It's really it's actually a really good show. Did you guys listen to the episode they had on on security? They uh, 
they were talking actually Jesse Frizzell was on the show yep. and and uh, Jesse was talking about container security and and she said you know the thing is you know uh, con- with, with containers you can actually make them quite secure you don't you know and but it's a matter of doing it right you know and so my question is do you really need unikernels to make containers secure and Neil what are your thoughts so um, there's a really, really important part of uh, the whole Unicron movement, and that's uh, actually got nothing to do with containers or virtualization. Uh, just like you know, we spent uh, when, I, when I was doing the work in Zen in the early days, we spent ages trying to convince people that uh, virtualization is a real technology. With Unikernels, it's uh, libraryfication. It, it needs a better word, but it's this entire shift. What did you call it? Uh, libraryfication. We're trying to turn library. every, all the dependencies turn into libraries. All the dependencies yeah, the turn into libraries. Just call Webster's and see. And, and just, just see what they can come up with, but. If you look at the entire stack of um, application level things, uh, what we tend to do is we tend to build small libraries out of things and we tend to reuse them. Then you hit the kernel and none of this code is reused in any way. So the massive movement is to convince people that systems code can actually turn into libraries. And once you do this, um, we can link those libraries into any form of configuration that we choose. We can turn them into uh, Zen unikernels, we can turn them into Docker containers, we can do what Jesse does by having these awesome static linked binaries that run in uh, extremely restricted setcomp rules. Uh, But the point is you don't have to rebuild the libraries every single time. Um, So to give you an example, uh, since I joined Docker, um, I've been doing a lot of work in unikernels, and it's got nothing to do with uh, Zen and virtualization. We've actually just uh, shipped Docker for Mac. So it's a desktop application where in the application we link all of these unikernel libraries and uh, we have a hypervisor built into the Mac application. And uh, we managed to put this app together in a matter of months. So entire TCPIP stacks, doing all kinds of translation, but using unikernels to hide the complexity from the end user. And in fact, we've just open sourced today a whole bunch of those libraries um, as part of um, the Docker open source initiatives. And these are unikernels, right? They're libraries that provide really sophisticated system stuff. And Ian can take those, uh, deploy them as part of Defer Panic, um, and no one needs to reinvent the world again. That's what the essence of unikernels really is. Uh, and that's where the role of open source is so important. Because I think I have the term. I, I think I have the term for this librarification. OK, you want to hear it? Go on, then. Library D, right? Library Library dependencies. Oh yeah. Okay. Library D. <laughs> it's a new system. That's D. it. There's lib C. <laughs> we can call it lib D. Yeah, it's a yeah, post right. C world, right? Yeah, so right. <laughs> the only thing we're banning is C code. That's the. Uh, <laughs> That's the <laughs> it's gonna be go. It's gonna be a camel. It's gonna be something else. And, but <laughs> unfortunately, I think we're still a few years off from uh, banning lib C. But. <laughs> but 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 Ian, but Ian, you know, you've actually been quite. Um, critical of containers and this yeah, and I this mean, container and this container frenzy, <laughs> so to speak. You know, so I mean, what's your view? I mean, is your view change? Is it? Are no. you no? Um, I mean, you know, I uh, containers are part of the kernel. The kernel is the problem. Um, I, I, as we'll discuss in the, the talk later on, you know, it's... This uh, is going to publish after your talk, so you can speak yeah. <laughs> freely about what's in your talk yeah, right here. I, I, I mean, honestly, there's there's many things that containers cannot do, won't do. Um, it, the whole container as a service thing is a little bit marketing bullshit. Okay, tell um, me why. Well, be, basically, until you can completely replace Google Cloud or Amazon with containers, like, it's just bullshit. Um, flat out, and so like you're oh, well, okay. So so I I'm, yeah. I'm, so, I'm, so I'm, you, I'm trying to like uh, spin yeah. this down. Sure. So sure. if you can't just do it with Google Cloud, you know, right. then, then then why is it bullshit? Well, because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, enge- engineers like to be complex. That's just the nature of the beast. But honestly, that's a horrible way to go through life. You need you need to make things simple. And you know, this is where all of our security problems come from. This is where all of our configuration management problems come from. You know, DevOps engineers in San Francisco can make more money than regular engineers. That's that's a bad problem to have. And um, it all stems from the fact that we have this monolithic beast of a kernel that's been in place since the 40s, you know, 1960s. And it, you know, when it was written, it wasn't written because of technical reasons. The operating system back then was written because of a business concern. It had to be multiple user, it had to be multiple process because the machines cost half a million dollars. That's completely different today Mm -hmm. in 2016. Right, right. So we have the infrastructure costs are way lower. Yeah, Yeah. way, way Way lower, lower. but our software is not quite kept pace. Right. You know, but you know, thanks to work done with Neil and um, everybody in that space, um, 
we're starting to see this you know come together and break out and so forth so josh well, i mean your perspective here on on you know on what ian is saying i mean you know from your, your guys perspective emc has been a long time provider of you know it technologies right you know um be it uh, storage um, storage hardware or you know virtualization software from EM, from uh, VMware, uh, you know now you're kind of in the platform as a service game with uh, you know your your investment in uh, Pivotal, uh, you know so you guys have really deep virtualization, uh, yep. v- deep virtualization, deep IT uh, background. I mean. You know, you know, does this, you know, is this really, is this really now that, you know, the time where you guys are having to make that demarcation from virtualization and why you are looking at unikernels? I don't know that it's a demarcation. I think what it comes down to is choice. Um, we have a tremendous number of customers that are banks and large, you know, hospitals and these types of organizations that are not going to move as fast as the rest of Silicon Valley moves. And then on the other hand, as, as EMC has evolved, we've you know, realize that our customers are evolving well, and so we put together this organization called EMC Code to basically become relevant and reach out to those customers that are interested in this stuff. Um, does it make up a majority of our market? Of course not, right? But the goal is to maintain relevance to those those customers, and, and that's that's what's interesting to me, and I think that's why EMC Code was created. And, and thus, if you look at the breadth of our projects inside of EMC Code, you know, we cater to everybody across the spectrum from the guys that are running our VMAX arrays that want to go library binding for it to, you know, folks that are interested in unikernels and Docker containers and things like that. So um, EMC Code is really about this relevance in this space. Um, and I think we've done a really good job of, of sort of creating sort of a, a small startup or a small a smaller organization inside of a very large organization to be able to do that. And, and I guess unikernels speak to somewhat of your roots, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I am, um, you know, I came from a, a high performance computing background and then um, I was in charge of the data center infrastructure for Siri for, for five years. And so I went through this, you know, this transition that everybody talks about where, um, you know, we ran one of the world's largest VM environments in the world, and then you know re- ended up running one of the largest containerized environments in the world. So we went through a, a, this big shift that I think a lot of our customers, and I think a lot of you know Neil has seen and Ian has seen, um, in a very very compressed time scale. So um, that's why I think EMC Code is fun and interesting to me, and I think it's why um, why our customers and I think why the communities responded to it so well. Like, <clears throat> if you look at you look at you know three letter acronym companies. Um, <laughs> Who is as relevant as EMC Code, right? I mean, I think that in a very short period of time, we've done some amazing things for the community, and I think Unique is one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, nobody would expect <clears throat> EMC, a storage company traditionally, to come out with a unikernel open source project that I think is neat, that I think actually solves some problems, helps adoption, and helps kind of you know, move the ball down the road, move the car down the road, right? So um, that's what's interesting to me about EMC code, and I think that's how it ties back into your question about relevance to EMC. So, so and, you know, why why are you know if, if contain you know if, if Ian saying that you know containers of service is marketing bullshit? Um, could you say the same thing about unikernels? The unikernels is pretty much BS as well. Do you know all of this marketing is bullshit until you you get people to believe in um, actually finding the sweet spot for the deployment? And so, what is that sweet spot? Um, for for unikernels, uh, for me personally, it's it's IoT. So, what I look for is problems that are absolutely insolvable unless you have some kind of a, a, a big phase shift in in the market. And I look at the cloud, and there's obviously a huge number of security problems. But um, I'm actually pretty confident that we can fix a lot of those problems um, in the operating system. There's uh, there's enough resources in x86 to, to pull that off. Uh, we've seen really incredible efforts from people like Jesse and so on to um, to to make uh, conventional operating system containers pretty pretty good. They'll never be perfect, but they'll be pretty good. But you look at IoT, and we have this unbelievable problem ahead of us. We have a trillion CPUs. We have physical devices that um, are in locations unknown, disconnected from the network, and carrying all of our personal data. And there's nothing like any of our technologies in these two. We don't have managed storage. We don't have managed um, uh, Docker-style APIs to control these IoT devices. And people are just deploying all kinds of custom embedded operating systems uh, without any controls whatsoever. So if you look at the sweet spot for unikernels, once you get past everything, if people built this new wave of technology using unikernels, then we have this 
ability to make the world a better place. So that's personally what, what I'm passionate about and what I want to see. So I've been uh, working hard on Docker ARM support, for example. Um, uh, Mirage OS, which is one of the Unicron projects I run, um, has just increasing uh, support for embedded devices. Um, it plays to the strengths of Unicron's amazingly. But when we started Unicron's, we had no idea. All we were doing was pushing this, this belief that there is something beyond operating systems, but we don't know where it would land. And honestly, I'm just psyched by all of these efforts right now. Um, you could argue there's bullshit behind all of them, but we need a bit of bullshit so we can all <laughs> step forward, believe, and not be stuck with operating systems forever. So that's that's the only way we'll make any progress. And you know, if one of our three efforts succeeds, then we're in pretty good shape. Bull bullshit's highly underrated. Yeah, bull yeah you know, we, 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 need, we need more bullshit with fundamentals, like unikernels. There's actual real code behind it. We've actually built real systems. People are trying um, to do deployments. Not all of them will succeed. That's the nature of, uh, of uh, pushing the envelope. And we'll, we'll find what works. Uh, so, in the end. So, so let's look at the momentum in the open source community then. Yeah. Where is the momentum? You know, we, you know, what, what, if you look back kind of like at Docker, for example, I mean, it really, uh, you know, boomed with kind of this whole kind of new thought process about packaging, really, and, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, what is the metaphor for kernels and is it uh, that will like that will help us think more think us put it in a context for application development so the, the network effect is around uh, these simple reusable components. So I think uh, in a lot of deployments these days, especially in the cloud, on ARM or x86, uh, developers are getting more power and they need the ability to build uh, more logic into their applications. You know, things like scheduling of networking traffic or uh, storage policies, things that were formerly in the remit of the actual uh, infrastructure. So in Mirage OS, uh, the project has just been going from strength to strength. I think we've just crossed 200 contributors. Um, and a lot of the uh, adoption has been from people who are coming along, they're spotting this set of libraries and they're spotting a little hole that they can contribute to. For example, someone just wants to pick up IMAP because they want to fix their email, and they build an IMAP library for it. And the only thing Mirage does is provide the framework for them to fill in um, and pour in their efforts. But when they're finished, this IMAP library can be used it can JavaScript, it can be reused in, in ARM unikernels. It's insane how far this code can mm. go. So Facebook, for example, yesterday just uh, um, announced something called Reason, which is um, an entire tooling layer on top of a camel. Uh, and I remember last year you asked me if a camel would, would go anywhere. And <laughs> last year I wouldn't have taken that bet. Honestly, if I'd said that, would have been bullshit. This year, 12 months on, we have Facebook committing to OCaml. We have uh, tripled the number of contributors to Mirage OS. We're shipping real Mirage OS code in Docker. So we're just seeing a network effect forming around um, the library D, the libraryfication, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but, Careful. Yeah. But we're seeing that also developers are... You don't are, want to get too marketing right Yeah, we don't want to... Yeah. You don't want to get too marketing. Library D, man. I mean, yeah. library D. Yeah, what, you, 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 just, you, just, you just come up with a new term. So uh, I wouldn't say it's got the same levels of growth as Docker. That, that's just once in a generation. But uh, it, I'm certainly busy merging PRs and, 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 and getting new people into the project. You should so, take some of our PRs. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And, you know, I'm, I'm, and meshing these things together is going to be fun, right? So adding Unix, um, Mirage support to Unix and, uh, and Defer Panic, it's all on our to-do list to pull off. We should probably have a hackathon at OSCON to, uh, to make sure this happens before we leave. So Ian, what's your, what's your thought on like where this space is right now in terms sure. of for open source? I mean, you know, <clears throat> tell us a little bit about what you're going to talk about today. And we're, you know, it's going to come up. Sure. You know. so, uh, so, so one thing just in the conversations that I kind of overheard and I have a little bit different viewpoint was um, everybody talks about security. Um, but if I call up a CIO in Tennessee right now, I don't talk about security. I talk about VM consolidation. Um, and so you have to look at market forces as, as well as, you know, the developer marketing efforts that are out there. Um, VM consolidation is a real thing. The ClickOS team, for instance, um, brag, you know, this any NEC engineers, um, they brag about booting up 10,000 virtual machines on one commodity server. 10,000. And they brag about migrating them in 20 milliseconds, booting them in five milliseconds. I mean, these are these are some incredible feats. They they I was at a unikernel conference. Yes, these actually exist. Uh, a couple months ago, and uh, you know the the team was talking about having to change like one or two lines of the Zen code just to modify the 1024 limit on the VMs um, because when they wrote that code, they were thinking, oh, nobody would ever boot more than a thousand VMs on one host. And so it was an arbitrary limit that they just kind of removed. And so consolidation's like an actual real thing. Yes, if your database uses 100 gigs of RAM and half a terabyte of storage, it's always going to use that resource. But if it's a simple blog that needs five megs here and there, you know, which is 
arguably a lot of the internet. Um, that's an actual real price point concern. No, I mean, I think that, that, uh, that what people are really looking for is um, operational efficiencies, right? Ian touched on this earlier, right? We ran between five and 600,000 VMs. Um, and, and so it wasn't so much about consolidation. We had you know, a tremendous number of machines to do it. Um, so you optimize your virtualized environment for failure domains, right? And we would never take all those VMs and run them on one, one specific host. Um, but one of the reasons for moving off of it was basically to gain this, this operational simplicity. Right? We wanted it to be simpler to operate and, and easier to operate. And I think that's where, um, I think that's where the, the drive for the unikernel stuff is going, is just simplicity. The other thing you can't do with containers right, is you can't have different kernelized components per application. Right? And I think that this idea around composable libraries for kernel level functionality gives you this flexibility and gives you this simplicity that a lot of people are looking for in the market. I also think, I still think that security is a huge one. I think that if you ask any CIO in the market, they will talk to you about security way before they'll want to talk to you about VM consolidation. I think that's probably third or fourth on their list. Um, and even if, you know, we've kind of gotten to the point where we're like, well, you know, we think it's secure, we've already built secure networks. A lot of these companies that have much older infrastructure are still very concerned about how can they move their organization forward and, and still kind of be safe, right? And they don't have sophisticated networking rules, they don't have DevOps engineers on staff, right? And so this is kind of an interest, I think it's a great first step forward, right? And, and things like Unique give us you know, that way to consume the technology in a format that the CIO already has heard about. Oh, I manage I manage unikernels with Docker. I've heard of Docker, right? That sounds good to me. Whereas if you kind of pull another technology out of your hat and say, now we're going to wave this around, he's like, but what about Docker? Like, no, no, no. This is this is kind of a, a gateway or a gateway drug. I think is kind of the way that we've looked at it. I see. I agree. With, I agree with all of this. It's just that. Um we're, we're wrapping this in a really digestible um, envelope for CIOs to take, yeah. but it's important to remember that we can do every once in a generation, we can fix the way that we actually right. deploy stuff on the internet. Yeah, right. There was unikernels in the 80s with you know, NetApp, right. Filers, iOS, right. and so on. So these days, uh, we, it's really important to remember that uh, getting the fundamentals right as we put them in, we can't just lash up libraries, put them in. So that's why in Mirage, we spent a huge amount of time in formal verification, um, just getting the, the low level components right. We spent seven years in the, on our damn TCP stack. It, it takes time to get these things right. And so when we deploy them, they've got to be high quality. And, right. and this is why, um, this is how we get past the marketing, right? This, this, this is a really good point, by the way. Um, we had the chance 25 years ago to go with the unikernel approach, and it, I'll approach this in the talk, but, uh, you know, Linus and Andrew Tenenbaum, who is, you know, a retired computer science professor, I mean, this was the way operating systems were going to be 25 years ago, and we lost. Um, so we can't afford to make the same mistakes uh, in the ecosystem today and lose the chance again because this is too important not to win. Well, what's the mistake happening now then in your view? Well, I, I don't think mistakes are happening right now. It's it's more of just fighting the, you know, history of 40 years of uh, multi-process, multi, uh, you know, address systems, uh, systems, so. And so what is the so what's the opportunity today, and what are some there's, of the... There's the current, uh, how do you pronounce it, hegemony, um, hegemony. Of, of the multi-process, multi-address space system model, and that's just like so dominant in everybody's mind because they don't have anything else. Um, if we can break that, um, we have a real chance of making sure the future actually works rather than being a complete shit mess. Hmm. So one of the things that you see in container technology is this... Uh, the the uh, uh, it's used by developers for application packaging, for example, um, and it's also being used increasingly in operations. And so you have these different, so that you have like this, you know, this, these two different communities who actually can find a common ground and understand common understanding through container technologies. And so they have different constructs about about the technologies right you know um, they have different they have different you know there's there's identity issues that go with that right am I a network engineer am I a developer sure right um, but uh, but there is that you know there is that kind of there is that continuity you know there, there's there, there's a continuity there and one of the things you really see missing um, are integrated 
you know, tool chains, right? You know, where you can start to see kind of the capability to use, you know, technologies, you know, for the developer and the operation people to kind of be thinking through on these integra you know, in, in, in an integrated way. So you can actually have that continuous Absolutely. delivery, right? You know, that seems to be um, one of the advantages of container technologies. I'm curious about how that's relevant to unikernels and you know, is there, what's the parallel or what's the contrast there? So this is why I'm having such a great time at Docker because um, it's also a matter of timing. Uh, when I joined Docker, it, the whole uh, architecture of the system was going through a, um, a phase shift. It went from just being something that ran Linux containers to something that abstracted away the details of um, the style of container. So Microsoft has now added support for Windows containers. Um, so there's clearly this um, point of abstraction coming into Docker. But it's also gone multi-CPU. So uh, support for ARM, for PPC64 has gone in. So Docker is now evolving on, on, on both both sides of, um, um, of the equation. The, the CPUs it runs on and the style of operating systems it runs. So at this point, it's great timing to introduce unikernels because it means that we have this continuum API where you look at everything that Docker supports. It's quite a big API because it obviously supports de development operations, um, how to ship stuff, um, how to sign stuff, how to scan for security vulnerabilities, and make sure the unikernels fit into all of those uh, points of the uh, the API. That's that's what I work on these days. And by doing this, it means that um, you future-proof the Docker API because if it supports unikernels, these are the most extreme way of deploying operating systems for the next 20 to 30 years that I can imagine. You can literally assemble artisanal unikernels that represent the extreme end of the specialization for the thing you want to do. And then you can backport to the entire set of operating systems we have uh, we have today. So Windows, Linux, um, the various patches for Linux to do VMs for containers, all of those just fit into the, the same set of APIs. Man, artisanal unikernels. <laughs> now, now this is getting very hipster. Well, well, well actually, every you unikernel know, is now, artisanal you know, right now. You know, <laughs> now, now, now if you're a developer with a, now you're a developer with a beard, you know, and you can, you know, you can make you know. I mean, Alex, talk about this. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get in the unicorn game. That's you should. You I should. mean, totally. We you should right make there. you a kernel. Yeah, that's right. We should. Let's bust out. We'll do a little hackathon right here. Yeah, we can right. just make the make new tech blog on running a unicorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so, um, you know, it's it would be very Portlandia, you know, <laughs> artisan unikernels. There I think we go. Be, you know, I'm from Portland, right? Honestly, it fits I mean, perfectly I, I think it for works. I, think, I, mean, I, mean, we can do, I think we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, but to, to less serious matters, um, but besides artisanal unikernels. Um, I can't believe you said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many terms that are coming out of this you, discussion. You, I mean, you like the, this? Uh, the, the uh, whole I mean, yeah. library D dependency issue, that's, that's actually kind of um, two ends of a spectrum, right? So one, you have kernel drivers, which are ostensibly a huge, huge deal, um, but nobody really deals with them. And then on the other end, you have like actual application-specific libraries. Like, I'll just throw out Image Magic because it's been in the news in the past weeks. You know, um, so so on on one end, you have kernel drivers. So you need to talk to the network. You need to talk to the disk. You probably don't need token ring. You probably don't need USB. You don't probably need a CD-ROM driver. But does it? Okay, but um, so so that's that's one thing, right? Um, and then the libraries is actually a real issue. Um, if I want to link to Image Magic because I want to become the next Instagram, for instance, um, and you'd be surprised how many applications actually use this library, um, you need to link that into your unikernel. Uh, most unikernels do not load uh, libraries at runtime. That's a feature, not a, you know, whatever. And so you have to actually link that in at compile time. That's a that's a real issue because developers are not used to right. managing dependencies in this fashion, especially in the interpreted wor world. And so that's like one of those components that's missing in the ecosystem right now. Um, there's there's many testing socks, for so, instance. Yeah. I think I think Dean's point. I mean, that's kind of where unique attempts to start to fill a void, right? That that some of the tooling that we've done around Unique can say, okay, we can see, for example, that you need this library and we can try to build it in for you and try to remove this burden of the developers from having to know every system call and every library required to run their application. They just, I mean, in the end, a developer wants to run instances of their application, right? right? And so if we can provide a tool chain, we're not gonna solve it automatically in all cases, but if we can provide them a pipeline to build unikernels and try to remove some of that burden from them and then also make that artifact operatable by by an ops person with a tool chain and, and interfaces that they understand 
we're kind of trying to like pave the runway a little bit or break down some of the friction that gets people into this technology. So tell me understand how then unikernels fit into a developer workflow. Yeah, so, I mean, honestly, the workflow changes quite a bit. Um, everything from testing to deploying to running the goddamn thing, um, all that changes. And so I think that's a little bit of the friction that tooling and the ecosystem has to figure out. Yeah. It's it's not a technical problem. It's it's just a it's just workflow time, right? Pr problem. Right. Because, well, then, does that change in how you, you know, you use APIs? Does it change? Oh, considerably, yeah. yeah. And that's that's part of the problem. So I, I, my my house has gone uh, full unikernel um, because I, I, I <laughs> yeah. So I decided to uh, I bought I bought Hue lights. I bought the uh, creepy Amazon Alexa that listens to everything we say. Yeah. And the interesting part of it is that um, the Alexa programming API is Amazon Lambda. So the only way to program it is by writing these little um, function fragments. So go to the Amazon cloud and you have to export somehow in your home uh, network somewhere for Amazon to call you back. So I've been experimenting with those kind of APIs except with unikernels. So the idea is a developer. I the rest of the household has no idea. Um, about <laughs> unikernels whatsoever. They just write a small fragment of code, and it, it is just executed by the fabric, the computation fabric you have, be it Docker, be it um, you know, whatever infrastructure you have. So we're seeing this phase shift already in developer land with the Lambda services. Microsoft's announced server function. Uh, Google has uh, you know its own equivalents, but they're very um, they're very surface right now because they're still ultimately running uh, a full right. operating system instance. They're not really getting the cost and security advantages of having these Lambda functions. So it's an obvious place for unikernels to yeah. go. Yeah, serverless then. So that's the, it, serverless is very close to unikernel, yep. not necessarily in function, but just the way it feels. So maybe that would be the possible change in the workflow, that it's yeah. less a concern about you know, architecting your application, yeah. but more like using the resources for the, the application. The, the, the thing is, is uh, <clears throat> whether or not, whenever the tooling happens, that's kind of regardless. Uh, right. what, what we're currently in is this 20 year kind of mega churn that's been occurring. Uh, you know, VMware came to market in roughly 2000, brought virtualization to the masses. You know, five years later, a small company from Seattle called Amazon um, came out with their infrastructure as a service. Three years after that, Heroku, you know, spawned this platform as a service. I thought they were completely insane at the time, but I just didn't know what was going on. Um, and then, you know, Docker and so forth a couple of years after that. And it, what, we're, what we're really seeing is this 20 year mega trend of the developer divorce from the server. Developers are moving further and further and further away from server re resources as they have to handle more, focus more on app specific code, that sort of thing. Yeah, someone suggested that we change our name to the no stack. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I think it's funny that you bring that up, right? Because I think everybody talks about, like, I don't care about infrastructure, I don't care about infrastructure. And we kind of, like, wave our hands and forget the fact that regardless right. of how we deploy our applications, like, it has to run somewhere. Yeah, right. And whether or not it's in Amazon or in Google or in VirtuStream, right? The infrastructure, it, it doesn't just exist ethereally in the cloud, right? It's not like the ether and the wire. Right. Like, it, it has to actually exist. And so... Um, I don't think we talk enough about how to compose this infrastructure mm -hmm. to support these kinds of technologies. Right. Everybody's like, oh, it's up to the developer, it's up it to the actually, developer, and the poor ops guy standing there right. with a server and a hammer going, I don't know what to do. It actually opens up lots of opportunities. I mean, it's, you know, I, I always, I always am, I'm, I'm always questioning like the, the dominance of AWS or the dominance mm -hmm. of, you know, of the major cloud service providers. And we discussed this yesterday about, you know, essentially every startup becomes a feature set of one of the cloud service providers. Or right, time, right. Right. But <clears throat> I don't think we've even seen the first dimension of actually what we understand is compute or understand right. what we understand is networking or what we understand is storage. And so, you know, so that means that, you know, what will actually a data center be in 10, 20 years? It, I think it'll still be a rack be, of machines. I mean, yeah. 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 the machines might look different. They might Fundamentally, cool the physical stuff is going to remain the same. Yeah. Now, the business side of things, I think that's going to incredibly change. I've, I've talked to more than enough CIOs to know that, you know, if you, if you asked me five years ago if Amazon's going to rule the universe, I'd be like, yes, of course. Um, nowadays, I totally disagree with that statement. And, uh, you know, it's I'm not saying we're going to devolve into some wireless mesh bullshit that's that's not happening um but we're definitely going to have like a much more distributed the so-called hybrid cloud um 
I hate that term, but you know that's that basically describes what we're What'd walking into. That? That's a marketing bullshit. Term. Yeah, <laughs> marketing <laughs> bullshit. I just want to make sure we set the table. Don't don't, don't underwrite bullshit. I, I mean, I think that um, if you look at this, um, one of the other open source projects we've done at EMC Code is something called Rack HD, mm. and it takes this idea around almost microkernels and lambda functions and applies it to deploying and managing infrastructure, mm. right? So. Yeah. And like somebody somewhere still has to put the infrastructure in sure. and make sure the BIOSes are updated and all that stuff to make sure that whatever we decide we run runs on top of it. So I think that as you see like that part of the ecosystem being addressed, like the physical layer, then it's again just paves the way for these new technologies to come in because somebody has to run unikernel somewhere, whether it's you know at home on your Raspberry Pi or in a data center somewhere. Like the servers have to exist. Remember, we're hitting physical limitations now, so I don't know. Um What's the weather in Austin? What do we got? Is that a good physical limitation? Well, you know, I'm asking the cloud right now. It's taking an embarrassing number of seconds. It's Ideally, raining I want my it's, it's raining out. It's raining out. Yeah, it's, not it's raining work. outside, right? It's going to be lightning. The cloud is foggy. I don't know yeah. if you look out the window here. So if you think about physical infrastructure, we have no idea how these IoT devices are put yeah, together. Really the coordination exactly. step has gone through my phone. It's going through the Oscom Wi-Fi. Yeah. Who knows where it's going, right? The compute needs to run here if you want to respond in 10 milliseconds, right. if yeah, you want your right. Oculus to give you real-time responses. So there's no way that a central cloud provider can pull that off. This yeah, is right. physical limitations. Yeah. Speed of Ta light. Ta is tachyons. Yeah. Once we get tachyon technology, we can do this. This. We're either Star Trek or we're building better APIs that will let developers build, you we know, delete all the time space all of a sudden. Is that what you're thinking? Again? <laughs> yeah. Star Trek unikernels. I mean, well, no. Yeah. I, I think Ian brings up, or, or uh, Anil brings up a great point about you know the application of unikernels in the IoT space and embedded spaces, right? Like operationally, if you're um, a company that sells embedded devices, doing updates to your software, pushing out across the globe, is substantially easier operationally if things are packaged as a unikernel right. as opposed to package some firmware and some software and then your application stack on top of it. Yep. So there are operational benefits. I, I think that that is, as companies, especially in IoT space, begin to realize that maybe that'll be the first, you know, the first one. Look at look at Tesla, yeah. right? Right. I mean, I think that's a phenomenal application of of um, the way that they they don't call it a unicorn, but the way that they do software updates over a, a very flaky wireless connection. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you very much for taking some time to talk this morning about unikernels, library D, <laughs> librarification, <laughs> librarification. Artisan unikernels. Run that by your marketing team and, you know, and see what they say. Yeah. I'm just, Luckily, I'm not in marketing. I, I, it did not mean from entering that. I'm just, I'm just going to put it out there. Put a unikernel on it. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Not a bird. This is unikernel's the thing. <laughs> this has been no stack. Thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but thank you guys very much for taking some time. It's actually been a really interesting discussion. There's so much more to talk about here. And so yep. I really look forward to following up with you guys all soon. Look forward to it. For sure. Thank you. And Thanks. look forward to your talk as well. It should be fun. Yeah. yeah. Also, Justin Carmack is uh, speaking tomorrow as well awesome. on, on programming languages and getting rid of C. Oh, so. She's yeah. one of the contributors to Justin's Kernel, great. So. Yeah. So it's going to be fun, Oscar. Yeah, it is. All right. Thanks, guys. Take Cheers. Coffee. Thanks. Awesome. Capital One is our sponsor here at Oscom for a day of discussions about open source and why it is so important for new stack organizations everywhere. Capital One is at the forefront of this new open source world with several efforts such as the opening of its APIs and open sourcing core technology such as Hygieia, its DevOps dashboard. Learn more about Capital One and its focus on developers at developer.capitalone.com.